Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates 2020 here on WCMU Public TV. I'm David Nicholas and this year we are speaking with our guests uh, remotely and virtually. Joined this time by Representative Scott Van Single. He is the Republican incumbent in Michigan's 100th uh, State House District, the incumbent seeking a third term to that office. Uh, congratulations on the August uh, win in the primary and in our uh, first moment or two, a little bit about you, your background and experience you bring to the campaign. Thanks, David. Good to be back, uh, or sort of back. Uh, wish we were in person, but uh, <laughs> we'll make do here. Uh, yeah, Scott Van Single, state rep for uh, going on four years, finishing up my second term. Uh, I was a financial analyst and accountant by trade uh, before I was a state legislator. And uh, in the four years that I've been in office, uh, I've served on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, I'm the, currently the chairman of the higher ed budget and uh, just found that fascinating as I learned more about our university systems in Michigan. Uh, so I sort of put those finance and accounting skills to use working on the state budget and uh, sort of bring a pragmatic approach, and, which is sort of common from West Michigan uh, as far as their styles. Uh, just trying to fix problems, uh, listening to people and uh, not having that hyper partisan mentality. Uh, just, you know, we, we hear about different problems in the district and those have become my priorities uh, as I go back to Lansing. As you campaigned leading up to the August primary and in the days, weeks, and months uh, since then, uh, you as candidate and also the voters that you've spoken to in District 100, what would you say are the top three issues as we are entering this campaign? There's really one issue, and that's getting uh, navigating this COVID crisis. And depending on what part of the state you're in, uh, that looks different. And I would say in West Michigan, in a rural community uh, like I represent, uh, people want to get back to work and they want to see things opened up, but they also want it done safely. Um, and it depends on the demographic. If you talk to someone my age that's in the workforce, uh, I want to get back to work. That's all I hear from people. Uh, I want to get back to normal. If you talk to somebody that's retired and uh, their health is really the more important thing. And, and so it's trying to balance those. I have young and old people and uh, people from all ends of the spectrum in my district. How do you safely get the economy running again, get people back to work, but not speed up the spread of this virus? So uh, that's really the, the entire focus of what we've been working on in Lansing right now. And they're really not right answers at this point. None of us have ever been through something like this before. So it's just trying to listen to experts and science and data and, and make those uh, decisions that, that balance public health with the economy. It's an impacted economy, certainly, and it is uh, likely to look different when we do emerge from this. You say that it's the work going on in Lansing now. What are some of the proposals you have at this point and that you're sharing with the voters that you want to take back to Lansing in an effort to restart what will be a reshaped economy as we're able to do so? Yeah, and it's not so much proposals at this point. Uh, we had quite a bit of movement in the legislature this week. And in fact, we were there till 3.15 in the morning uh, Wednesday, and uh, I'm still trying to recover from that here on Thursday. But uh, uh, you know, a lot of it's working with the governor. As you know, at this point, the uh, Supreme Court struck down her ability to issue these executive orders. So everything since April 30th has been ruled invalid. But there were some good things in those executive orders, uh, liabilities for healthcare workers, uh, uh, you know, unemployment issues or the extensions on unemployment and eligibility there. So we had to go back and put some of those things into law to help people. Um, and one of the items that we worked on uh, this week in particular was uh, liability reform. If, if businesses are have proper protocols in place uh, for public safety, it provides some liability protection. We, you know, some of these small businesses are right on the very edge of survival. They could be sued out of existence. Uh, and so we're trying to provide a little bit of flexibility there. And then uh, some protocols for nursing homes as well. Uh, that was one of the more unpopular items earlier this year was uh, uh, forcing some of the COVID positive patients into nur uh, certain nursing homes. And uh, we cleaned that up a little bit through statute. So. Uh, we made quite a bit of progress this week. Uh, again, a lot of us are pushing for a more regionalized approach. Uh, it is regionalized, but some of us would go as far as what about by county? And so, for example, my district, I go all, all the way up to Lake County. We're lumped in with Kent County in Grand Rapids, and you couldn't pick two more polar opposite counties. There's 11,000 people in Lake County. 
there really hasn't been a massive outbreak of the virus up there. People live miles apart in some cases. Uh, so I think it would make more sense to have a county-by-county county approach to dealing with this uh, rather than the, the regions that we currently have. With this overall impact of COVID-19 just giving us a whole different look to all of the issues that that uh, candidates and, and voters are talking about, to the issue then of, of public health, managing the crisis and issues that coming through this crisis have brought to bear in terms of the overall public health system. What are the voters telling you and, and what do you see as the things that we need to do uh, differently as we continue to move forward? Yeah, hopefully this is a learning experience for all of us. Uh, something like this probably will happen again someday. I, I hope it's another hundred years and none of us have to live through it, but very likely not. So. Uh, we, we saw weaknesses in our supply chain uh, as far as non-essential items. Uh, you know, we're, we're tied to foreign countries, probably more than what we should be as far as uh, supply chain. But uh, we saw that with food production. Uh, a lot of us remember the uh, $10 a pound for ground beef uh, not too many months ago. Uh, farmers are great at producing, but we found bottlenecks in our supply chain as far as getting food to the grocery stores. So we need to go back and look at some of those items. Does that economically provide an opportunity on the other side of this uh, as, as then this aspect come, becomes um, something that, that deals with it on an, on an economic issue that we look at that supply chain and how we might change that again on the other side? Yeah, Americans are smart and innovative and uh, capitalism fixes a lot of those problems. So I'm, I'm sure you'll see somebody figure this out and uh, we'll come out with a safer supply chain and, and more efficient on the back end of this. But uh, in the short term, uh, there's some pain. And we're also seeing that in the healthcare industry, uh, we tried to open up uh, capacity in some of the hospitals for a, a massive influx of COVID patients. And thankfully that didn't happen, but we also shut down about 70% of the revenue model at the same time. And so maybe on the, the back end of this, we need to look at uh, capacity in hospitals as uh, some of these hospitals are probably going to need a bailout or, or will cease to exist uh, when this is over. And uh, that's not a sustainable business model either. Uh, we can't, uh, you know, the feds have printed about $4 trillion in funds to deal with this over the past few months. This isn't something that's sustainable that we can continue to bail industries out. Uh, we, we need to try to be more self-sufficient. You mentioned the, the rural aspect of uh, the district um, in relation to the, the, the region that's impacted you in, in coming from Kent County and, and Grand Rapids. So if you look at, at the rural areas, Lake County and, and others in 100, um, what does that do then when we look at the availability of health care? Do you see um, a, a real risk and things that, that will directly have to be uh, addressed? And if so, how um, as we come through this to make sure that those areas do not lose health care access? Yeah, some of these areas don't have adequate health care access to begin with. Uh, Lake County, for example, doesn't have a hospital. Uh, so you're talking, depending on where you live in the county, potentially 45 minutes or to an hour to drive to another county to a hospital. Uh, and a lot of these northern areas don't have the capacity in those hospitals because they don't have the, uh, the population. So we, if we actually did have an outbreak in our areas, we could be hit worse than some of the urban areas as far as uh, hospital capacity compared to our population. Uh, so those are things that we need to address and uh, what the proper way is to, to do that or who's going to figure that out. Uh, I don't know at this time. Is it a legislative fix? Is this something the industry does on their own? These are conversations that we need to have. The schools were certainly impacted by uh, an early shutdown in the spring and varying degrees of being open or blended learning as the fall semester got underway. Uh, what has been uh, the issue then that the voters and or you see uh, or issues that, that surround education as to the situation we're in and again, the idea of moving forward beyond COVID-19. Yeah, I've been in regular contact with my local superintendents, and one of the things I'm hearing from them is overwhelmingly parents in this area want their kids physically in school. 
I, I think a lot of them got the, uh, myself included, had the opportunity to become teachers last spring and it didn't go so well. And uh, I found out what my calling is not in life. Uh, I'm gonna stick with my day job. But uh, what, what we're hearing from the locals, and, and again, it gets into demographics. You're talking parents that have kids in school, they tend to be in their 30s and 40s and healthy and in the workforce. They want life to go on as much as normal uh, versus the older demographics. So uh, depending on the district, we're anywhere from 70 to 90% of the students are in person in class right now. Uh, but that for the, the parents that aren't comfortable sending their kids for whatever reason, whether it's health related or uh, there's just a little bit more fear there or, or they have elderly you know, parents that the kids may come into contact with. Uh, we have uh, internet uh, issues here. We, we don't have uh, high speed internet to do a lot of these Zoom meetings and uh, remote learning uh, that might be available in an urban area. So that really puts some of these rural areas at a disadvantage. Again, thankfully, we have higher numbers of students that actually are attending in person, uh, maybe partly because of that reason too. But uh, uh, so there's there's challenges in these rural areas that we don't have in the urban areas. Looking at that broadband availability then in, in uh, this uh, last minute before we get to a final statement from you for the campaign, um, then does this become something that can be done legislatively or how to deal with that issue of the lack of the broadband access? Yeah, it's difficult to force a private business to install infrastructure at a loss. Uh, so there, there has to be some sort of subsidy involved to, to continue to expand broadband and in, in high-speed internet into rural areas. We did just pass a bill a few weeks ago that did exactly that, that, that had some funding attached to it. Uh, because in, in prior years, every time we tried to do this, people would just add another provider, or upgrade the service in already dense areas in the the non-dense or rural areas continue to lack service. This would mandate that it has to go to unserved areas. And, uh, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but uh, I, that I was pretty happy with that bill the other day uh, or a few weeks ago. In the final half minute then with you, sir, um, a final message as the voters are getting set to go to the polls, what is that message you want to leave with them? Yeah, well, I'd like to thank them for the opportunity the last four years to serve in the legislature. And uh, I continue to be a, pragmatic uh, person who listens. Uh, I put people over party and uh, will continue to do that in my last term. And uh, we have some major problems that we didn't foresee a year ago that continue to pop up. And we need pragmatic uh, thinkers, problem solvers to be in these roles to, to fix problems and not just listen to their political parties in the loudest voices. Well, we appreciate your time in speaking with us and to those prospective voters in the 100th district. Uh, stay safe, good luck with the rest of the campaign, and thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Yeah, thanks, David, good to see you again. We have been speaking with Representative Scott Van Singel, the Republican incumbent in Michigan's 100th House District. He is seeking a third term to that office. Under Michigan election law, all qualifying party candidates for these offices have been invited to participate in this series. I'm David Nicholas, thanks for joining us. We hope you will again. And remember to go out and cast your vote Tuesday, November 3rd.